Mass Effect Deception by William C. Dietz Prologue on the planet Karshan Many weeks of effort had been required to track the object from the point where it had been stolen to the Batarian homeworld in the ancient city of Thondu. There were lots of things Kai Leng didn't like about the place, including the overcrowded streets, the asymmetrical architecture, and the food. But most of all, he didn't like the Batarians themselves, not because so many of them were pirates, slavers, but because they were aliens, and therefore a threat to the human race. That made him an extremist, not to mention a racist, and that was fine with Lang. The auction house was located off one of Thondu's serpentine streets. A flight of stairs led up to the front door. Because of an injury sustained during a recent and especially difficult mission, Lang was using a cane as he mounted the steps one at a time. Having passed through a pair of open doors, he entered a generously proportioned lobby where he was confronted by a security checkpoint and two battalions. Each alien had four eyes, all eight of which stared at the human with open suspicion. Lang offered the invitation to the guard on the right, who passed it in front of a scanner. The electronic document was real, having been purchased from a local businessman at considerable expense, and the Batarian nodded respectfully. You can enter, but the handgun stays here, and leave the cane too. No problem, Lang replied as he gave both items to the second guard. Take good care of them. You can pick them up on your way out, the other guard growled as he placed both the pistol and the cane on a table loaded with weapons collected from other guests. At that point, Lang was ordered to empty his pockets onto a tray. The effort produced three coins, a pillbox, and a stylus. The first guard eyed the collection, uttered a grunt, and motioned toward a metal frame. Please step through the metal detector. Not having set off any flashing lights or buses, Lang was allowed to recover his belongings and proceed to the room beyond. It wasn't that large, and didn't need to be, since only a limited number of people were wealthy enough to buy the type of merchandise the auction house specialized in. With nothing else to look at, all eyes were on Leng as he made his way to the front of the room and took a seat next to an elderly Turian. It would have been nice if he'd been able to intercept the object before it was offered for sale, but having failed to do so, Leng was prepared to do it the hard way. Time seemed to drag as two additional guests arrived, took their seats, and waited for the auction to begin. Finally, a well-dressed Volus appeared and took his place behind the podium. Good afternoon, gentle beings. My name is Dostasser, and I will serve as your auctioneer today. All of you have had access to the catalog and are therefore familiar with the items that will be offered today. Bids will be submitted in increments of a thousand or a million credits, and all sales are final. Are there any questions? No? Then the auction will begin. The first item in the catalog is a Prothean egg, which, when activated, opens to reveal a holographic star map. And because the map is not consistent with any part of known space, experts assume that the system depicted lies somewhere beyond our galaxy and must have been important to the Protheans. If so, and if the purchaser is able to figure out where these planets are, they might be able to claim a technological treasure trove so valuable that the cost of the egg will be negligible by comparison. Bidding will start at 10 million credits. Do I hear 11? There was a bid at 11, followed by many more, and a final offer of 52 million, which was sufficient to secure the elaborately decorated egg for a beautifully dressed Asari whose face was hidden by a carefully draped veil. Did she intend to find the star system projected by the egg? or to place it on a shelf where it would serve as a conversation piece. Lang didn't know and didn't care. The next object was a vial of tears that had been shed by a Turian saint. Oh, that's what Tassa claimed, even though there was no proof of such a thing, and the liquid in the container could have been tap water. However, that didn't stop the Turian seated next to Lang from paying 5,000 for the relic. And, judging from his demeanor, he was happy to do so. With that out of the way, it was time for Tassa to take bids on the object that Lang was after. And here it is, the Volus said as he raised what looked like a crystal gemstone for the audience to inspect. Light reflected off the device and made a pattern on the walls. Here, sealed inside a protective matrix, 
is the design for a DNA-specific bioweapon. The seller, who prefers to remain anonymous, claims that if released among the human population, this disease would target a person known as the Elusive Man, an individual said to be the founder of Cerberus. We, of course, cannot attest to the truth of that, nor be held responsible for the results should such a disease be released. So, ladies and gentlemen, bidding will open at five million. Do I hear six? Lang not only knew about Cerberus, he worked for the organization, and had for more than ten years. And because of that, he understood the threat. Not just to the elusive man, but to tens of thousands of people who were distantly related to him, all of whom would be equally vulnerable. And that was why Lang threw the coins. They struck the floor all around Tassa, producing a series of loud bangs and a cloud of dense smoke. Lang was already on his feet by then. A few swift steps carried him to the front of the room where the Volus was just starting to turn away. Lang grabbed a wrist, took the Matrix, and let go. A well-aimed kick put the auctioneer down. But Lang wasn't the only person in the room who wanted the object, or was willing to commit violence in order to obtain it. Like Lang, the man who attacked him was unarmed, but he was strong, as became evident when he wrapped an arm around Lang's throat. Lang grabbed onto the attacker's arm with both hands and pulled down while simultaneously pressing his chin against his chest. That allowed him to take a precious breath while he bent both knees and lowered his center of gravity. Then he pulled, straightened, and felt the man flip up and over. He continued to hold onto the man's arm, which caused the assailant to land on his back. Lang stomped on his face, felt something give, and knew that part of the fight was over. Then, having turned toward the back of the room, Lang pressed the button on his stylus. His pistol, or what looked like a pistol, produced a loud boom as it exploded, hurling shrapnel in every direction. When he entered the lobby, both of the Batarian guards were down, and one was clearly dead. Don't bother to get up, Lang said as he bent over to pick up his cane. I'll find the door on my own. Then, having completed his mission, Lang limped away. His right leg was on fire, but the Matrix was safe. The elusive man would be pleased, and he could leave Karshan. Life was good.